Dear Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar by the European Institute for Asian Studies, EIS, on the topic of Kazakhstan's international human rights commitments in the light of political and institutional reforms. Let me first congratulate our guests from Kazakhstan on the celebration of 30th anniversary of independence this year, as well as being elected on 14th of October, 2021, as a member to the next upcoming rotation round of the United Nations Human Rights Council for 2022-2024, after its previous successful participation in the 2013-2015 UN Human Rights Council. Within the past two years, there has been significant political reforms seeking to address the expansion of civil rights and human rights within the nation under President Kasim Yomar Tokayev and his government. Human rights commitments made by the Republic of Kazakhstan are reflective of a real desire to conform to international standards in an ever globalizing world. In order to further socio-economic advancements in Kazakhstan, there is also a need for a clear objective discourse on both the strengths and potential weaknesses of the policies and choices taken by the government. Therefore, reports are useful in understanding the commitments made by the Kazakh government and give credit where credit is due. Reports such as those by the OSCE, the UN Human Rights Committee and Human Rights Watch have maintained a necessary critical position while still recognizing the progress Kazakhstan has made on several fronts. The report by one of our panelists, Yerun Janssen and his associates at Equis on the human rights situation in Kazakhstan does well to highlight the political reforms undertaken by the nation in recent years. There are indeed many promising commitments, treaties and agreements which lay out the groundwork for a more developed and progressive Kazakhstan. Within the work done by Equis, considerable although sometimes condensed references are made to the reports by internationally reputable organizations and their recommendations. Specifically, there are several observations concerning gender equality, electoral integrity, and other human rights commitments, which requires further exploration. In regard to gender equality, as outlined in the Aquis report, there have been promising advancements, such as the establishment of a 30% quota for women and youth representatives on electoral party lists. As well as this, here at EIS, the report was written just last year in 2020, denoting the progress made by Kazakhstan in women empowerment and gender equality, notably with reference to education and income equality in some sectors. However, the fifth periodic report of Kazakhstan by the Committee on the Elimination and Dis of Discrimination Against Women, as cited in the ECWIS paper, provided both highly critical and complementary observations. For example, the report acknowledges and welcomes the laws ratified by Kazakhstan to increase female public participation as well as income equality. However, the report also addresses key concerns such as the continued existence of a list of jobs prohibited for women and recent changes of, to the panel code resulting in the discrimination of physical violence in domestic contexts, which goes against the Istanbul Convention. The committee concluded the state party should restore full criminal responsibility and related punishment for sexual violence. On the top of Kazakhstan's electoral process, the Aquis report also summarized and the positive amendments to the election law 
aimed at enhancing participation of voters of long with disabilities and women candidates. However, ultimately the OSCE and the ODIHR identified a range of long-standing recommendations which remain unaddressed, including those related to fundamental freedoms in potentiality of election administration, eligibility to vote and stand for election, voter registration, the media and publication of election results. During the 10th January 2021 parliamentary elections, the OSCE's limited election observation mission highlighted several of these concerns, also issued by the International Observation Mission in the statement of preliminary findings and conclusions. The UN Human Rights Committee shared similar concerns in their second periodic report in Kazakhstan under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and also raised concerns in detail on a range of other human rights topics. The ACWIS paper does mention this report by the Human Rights Committee with greater detail in Annex 1. However, greater attention is required on both the positive steps taken by Kazakhstan as well as the concurrent recommendations and concerns. Although Kazakhstan is effectively working through recommendations made, notably on capital punishment, torture and reforming the judiciary, there's still a need to develop further the human rights initiative in the country. This can only be done through an open and transparent discourse on the human rights situation in the Republic of Kazakhstan. Here, reports such as those by ACWIS, the OSCE, the UN, the ILO and the Council of Europe should be examined, compared and discussed in order to achieve a greater understanding of the reality of the situation in Kazakhstan and what steps need to be taken to continue Kazakhstan's liberal reforms and democratization. In this EIS webinar, we hope that the presentation of the report by Jeroen Janssen will serve as a platform to discuss more in depth the reforms made as well as the overall human rights situation in Kazakhstan and in its international significance. I now have the pleasure of passing the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Marvelan by Mukan, the ambassador of Kazakhstan. Please, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, everyone hear me and uh, if it's okay, I, I would like to start. Uh, thank you for your invitation, uh, being one, uh, with you and um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, I am grateful to the European Institute for Asian Studies and uh, to its CEO, Mr. Gottals, for hosting this important webinar. Um, the EIS is a unique research center with uh, vast experience in the study of our region. Our embassy is always keen uh, to collaborate uh, with Mr. Gottals and his team and contribute to a better understanding of a wide variety of issues of common interest, both to the European audience and uh, Kazakh uh, people. Today, I'm honored that Kazakh officials, uh, academic and NGOs representatives were uh, able to join this webinar. Uh, Madame Azimova, human rights ombudswoman of Kazakhstan, Madame Espinova, head of the Kazakhstan Center for Civil Initiatives. Unfortunately, Mr. Sidumanov, head of Kazakhstan Institute of Philosophy, Political Science and Religious Studies was not able to come to you the urgent matters in Kazakhstan. Moreover, it's a great pleasure to welcome high representatives of the EU that decided to join this event. I warmly welcome Excellencies Ali Babeli, a member of the European Parliament and Vice Chair of the European Parliament's delegation on Central Asia and Mongolia, because Madame Zanok, a member of the, of the European Parliament and the CAS delegation, as well as the Vice Chair of the Committee on Petitions. Uh, Mr. Klister, dear colleague, Head of Division for Central Asia and at the European External Action Service. And also I welcome Mr. Janssen, Managing Partner of IQ and EU Law and Policy. As you know, uh, his team initiated this report, Kazakhstan International Human Rights 
commitments in the light of political and institutional reforms. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear guests, um, this year Kazakhstan indeed uh, celebrates the 30 years, the 30th anniversary of its independence. Uh, over this, uh, the years, Kazakhstan has become a match and experienced a state seeking to strengthen its contribution to the rule of law and democracy. The political institutional reforms are cornerstone of Kazakhstan commitments toward the further application international agreed human rights standards at the national level. Well, on the initiative of President of Kazakhstan, Mr. Tokayev, uh, large scale political reforms have been launched in our country in terms of protection human rights, build, building a democratic society and introducing the concept of the uh, listening state. Uh, as you know, the listening state of, uh, the concept of a listening state that puts people, their needs and wants to above all. Uh, it's uh, is it very core for political transformations undertaken by, by our leadership. At the present time, uh, the short packages of reforms is being implemented aimed at socioeconomic and socio-political transformations. In addition, uh, the plan of priority measures in the field of human rights was adopted by, by uh, our uh, government and uh, <clears throat> uh, we can already witness results of all these actions. Now more 90% of amendments to legislat legislative documents are initiated by Kazakhstan NGOs. So as you know, we have around 27,000 uh, 27, uh, registered NGOs at least 70,000 NGOs play an active role in the legislative and executive process in, in Kazakhstan. Well, I believe that our esteemed guests from Kazakhstan will explain this initiative in more detail. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as mentioned, Mr. Gotlas, uh, indeed, uh, on October 14th, Kazakhstan was selected as a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council for upcoming three years. After the previous successful experience of joining the Human Rights Council in 2013-2015, Indeed, it's a powerful sign of significant process of and huge incentive for new reforms and partnerships. On the EU track, on the European Union track, the dialogue on human rights is regularly held between law enforcement agencies of Kazakhstan and the European External Action Service. Kazakhstan Parliament is closely interacting with the European Parliament's the CAS delegation, a Fed committee, DROA subcommittee. Uh, uh, as you know, the last meeting was held on October 11th uh, this year here in Brussels. Our delegation was, the, by the way, the first delegation visiting European Parliament since the pandemic started. So it was led by uh, the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee of Majelis of Kazakhstan, Madame Aigul Kuspan. She might be known to you, to you by her previous activities and best of Kazakhstan to, to Brussels. <clears throat> uh, Ladies and gentlemen, to, I would like to also add something additional. Um, today, the agenda of international communities much focused also on the political and humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. On this its part, Kazakhstan is committed to providing humanitarian assistance to Afghan people, promoting the rights of all Afghans, especially for especially women and girls. As you know, Kazakhstan responded to the call for the temporary deployment of the UN mission to Afghanistan on our territory, particularly in Almaty, which continues to work to coordinate the provision of assistance to the population of Afghanistan. This month, uh, 5,000 tons of wheat flour was sent to this country. In addition, our government uh, will provide more than 100,000 doses of Kazakhstan's vac Kazakh vaccine as a part of its humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. We highly appreciate the international support of Kazakhstan initiative to create a logistic hub in Almaty, which would coordinate the delivery of much needed goods and services to Afghan people. This initiative was already supported by UNAM and other, other our partners. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> concluding my remarks, I would like to express my hope that today's webinar and report will help enforce our mutual trust and future oriented cooperation between Kazakhstan and the European Union, uh, as well as between the EU and the Central Asia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all, all of you constructive dialogue and uh, fruitful discussion. 
And thank you once again. And I will I give back my virtual mic to Mr. Gattles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bai Mukan. Thank you. Now we have the pleasure to give the floor, the virtual floor, to Mrs. Alvira Azimova. She is the Ombudsman of Kazakhstan for the Human Rights. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Axel, thank you so much. And overall, I would like to thank you for the webinar you organized today. You know, I can say one thing. Uh, we were waiting impatiently uh, for the publication of the EIS because I believe that any country is interested not only in assessing itself, but also in listening um, to the opinion of uh, independent um, analysis. And uh, every country has its peculiarity that cannot be denied. However, the global trends, international trends and international standards cannot be ignored. And especially it is applicable to human rights. And of course, we cannot ignore them because any country which would only uh, follow its own national interests uh, could always be criticized. There are uh, accepted standards and rules and principles as well as the norms of international law. And in the end, Kazakhstan also sees itself as a transparent country, as an open country. And in this context, what is important, what is important for us is the external assessment. It doesn't have to be positive. Even if we're talking about criticism, it is extremely important to be to have uh, constructive criticism. Allow me to underline that in my work, the issue of uh, criminal justice is most frequently criticized as well as human rights uh, in penitentiary institutions, especially in closed penitentiaries. From my side, I see this as a very uh, important topic. We receive most complaints from detained people, from prisoners uh, concerning their rights and the respect for their rights during the criminal prosecution uh, process and uh, when they are already detained. So uh, those governmental bodies who are responsible for that, um, from the point of view of the penitentiary authorities or judicial authorities, they need to be open. And they themselves say that, yes, they are ready to listen to your recommendations. I believe this is important. And this is one of the most issues within my mandate. We need to sit down together and we need to discuss those issues openly. And naturally, sometimes those assessments will not be very pleasant. Sometimes they are... Uh, critical. However, during a discussion, the truth will be born. So, of course, we'll be able to find some common ground, especially where the human rights are concerned. And in those issues, this is not a, a question of finding. We must find those uh, that common ground. I would also like to express my gratitude to the European Parliament members who are present here and civil society representatives. Uh, some Kazakhstan experts, oh, well, we meet for the first time here, and you know I received the list recently, so I would be interested in listening to their opinions as well. And of course, my great wish is to keep on working. That's why I would like to thank the embassy for providing their support here, because by inviting us to this uh, webinar here, they, they showed their support. In the context of international recommendations regarding um, strengthening the institutions and the Institute uh, of Ombudsman, and that was also part of the 13th periodical review, um, they uh, coincide with the parliamentary discussions in Kazakh's parliament about the mandate of Ombudsman. Experts of uh, OEC, of Asian and uh, Pacific Forum were also involved in that. And Kazakhstan, since 2014, is a part of that particular regional group and the Global Alliance 
of uh, independent uh, human rights and the nation committee and uh, Kazakhstan is not a, part, a member of the Council of Europe. Nevertheless, European values are not ignored in Kazakhstan. We study them, we accept them, and to a certain extent, we see them uh, as a study case. We look at certain countries as a study case. We do understand that it is one thing when experts or researchers or politicians or international diplomats or experts uh, make their recommendations and it is another thing uh, how we working in the field implement them looking at how european countries implement european recommendations in the human rights area is a very important study for us and we do see that the council of europe members and the eu members also face similar problems and these are the problems uh, which are assessed both in the critical and a positive way. So what I'm trying to say is that we're all facing the same problem, how to join our efforts. And during the lockdown, we saw that a number of issues became more acute and the proportionality is also needed. So what I'm talking about here is to bring uh, the uh, health issues in balance with the human rights. And this is something that is being discussed on all platforms, on all fora. And what I see here in your research is that those issues were also covered. I believe that uh, European Parliament members and our experts and independent experts represented here will continue this dialogue. It is needed. Talking about the lessons learned from the pandemic, well, this is one of the issues which clearly demonstrated that we don't really need to wait for the end of the lockdown. No, this is not going to happen. We need to reconsider certain issues and uh, certain guidelines. On the other hand, uh, your research gives some examples of Kazakhstan reality. Allow me to remind you that the Ministry of Justice uh, has visited Brussels, well, minister visited Brussels to be more precise, and they also looked at the human uh, rights issues during the meetings with the uh, European Parliament members. We shouldn't uh, forget uh, the representatives of the civil society, those who are present here. They have their own uh, point of view and perspective. I would like to underline the fact that uh, we cannot ignore both positive and cri critical issues here. Uh, it will be counterproductive. On the other hand, we need to welcome the fact that Kazakhstan, despite challenging, despite uh, issues uh, which were mentioned by president as part of the political reforms, our country uh, or also put forward the application for the Human Rights uh, Council of the UN. And I believe that uh, uh, the fact that we became a member will um, mean that Kazakhstan will have to listen closer to all the obligations from within and from the outside. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take part in the dialogue. If there are any questions, I will be happy to take them. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Azimova, for your presentation. Now we have the pleasure to give the floor to Jeroen Janssen, Managing Partner of Acquis EO Law and Policy. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Axel. Um, Your Excellency, Ambassador Baimukan, esteemed uh, panelists, members of the European Parliament, distinguished guests, um, first of all, a, a word of appreciation for the European Institute for Asian Studies for hosting this, uh, this webinar uh, and this, uh, this event. Um, we are looking forward to a very productive and informative session. Um, first of all, uh, and it has been mentioned already before, I would like to congratulate Ambassador Baimukan and by extension the, um, the wider stakeholders in uh, Kazakhstan 
with the recent election of Kazakhstan as a member of the Human Rights uh, Council for the years 2022 to 2024. Uh, Kazakhstan's second time election for a seat on this global human rights platform uh, reflects the important work undertaken by Kazakhstan in reforming and progressively implementing the human rights commitments Kazakhstan signed up to, uh, and also uh, a clear illustration of the willingness to discuss and engage internationally on this important topic. Our firm, Aki EU Law and Policy, uh, is specialized in legal and public policy services and initiated this report, report on the state of play of Kazakhstan's international human rights commitments. This was also driven by the awareness that the European institutions and the wider stakeholders, including NGOs, have demonstrated a keen interest in reviewing the human rights aspects as part of the wider EU-Kazakhstan relationships. The implementation of human rights commitments is an evolutionary process. It has been mentioned by the previous speakers as well. In this context, let me provide you with a few words about my professional background and personal experience in this respect. As a lawyer uh, specialized in human rights law, I joined the Dutch Foreign Ministry in 1990, which seems ages ago, but uh, is still remembered vividly. Part of my responsibilities in my first posting was the coordination of the contributions from the various ministries and institutions in the Netherlands relevant to compose the so-called periodic reports under the various uh, human rights treaties that the Netherlands signed up to. The most important lesson learned at the time was that the implementation of human rights commitments was indeed an evolutionary process. Also for countries like the Netherlands that have the tendency to tell the rest of the world uh, how to behave and how to implement human rights standards. Uh, and sometimes it came as a surprise that after the periodic reports were reviewed by the um, expert bodies under these uh, human rights treaties, that there were very pertinent recommendations on further improvements of the implementation of these human rights standards. And at the time in particular, even as you know, evident uh, issues like the non-discrimination or the equal treatment between men and women, uh, the gender equality. This was an issue that, uh, that was codified uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a rather uh, classic, um, non-respectful way when it comes to the equal treatment of, of men and women, and this needed to be addressed. Also issues uh, in the wider uh, reach of the, of the kingdom, uh, in the overseas uh, countries and territories that are part of the kingdom of the Netherlands, including the conditions and the treatment of prisoners in detention centers in the Caribbean, in the Netherlands Antilles, Curaçao, Aruba. Uh, we had to engage in, in serious discussions and training sessions with the leadership uh, in those uh, parts of the kingdom in order to improve those standards. So uh, human rights concerns and human rights improvements are not reserved for third countries only. Uh, they are also to be reflected upon within the European Union itself. Um, in that respect, I also wish to, to, to recall what um, Mrs. Azimova also referred to in the COVID crisis. During the COVID crisis, many of the uh, European fundamental rights that we took for granted were put to the test because of restrictive measures that were not always necessary and were also not always proportionate. Uh, many of these uh, measures were challenged in court and applying these uh, recourses to, uh, to justice uh, was an important safeguard for the protection of these, these rights and many of these cases and and policy reviews are still ongoing. Um, let me also say that um, as a former Dutch diplomat um, tasked with uh, EU coordination in third countries, uh, during my last full posting as deputy ambassador to, to Lebanon, um, the European delegations and the embassies uh, of European member states in a particular third country, in this case it was Lebanon, 
I believe, spent approximately 20 to 25 percent of their time in EU coordination meetings on assessing the state of play when it comes to civil society, human rights, the protection of human rights, and how uh, the European Union can assist third countries in further elaborating and further improving the human rights standards. So it is a feature that uh, not only uh, applies to textbook um, implementation um, or uh, bureaucratic processes, it is a very genuine uh, topic, one of the cornerstones of EU foreign policy that um, will always be present and in most cases in a very collaborative and constructive way in dialogue with countries and partners around the world. A rather long winding introduction to come to the introduction of the current report, which is published on the uh, website of the uh, EIAS. The report on Kazakhstan's international human rights commitments was produced in accordance with a very clear methodology. It is based on a detailed review of the treaty obligations in the field of human rights that Kazakhstan entered into since its independence in 1991. The review includes an analysis of the most recent reports and the debates on these reports in the main human rights fora, the Human Rights Council, the Universal Periodic Review, UPR, as well as the treaty bodies established under the various UN human rights conventions and treaties. For the purpose of this report, the analysis is based on thorough desk research of the official documents, statements, and other information, including those of prominent non-governmental organizations with a focus on human rights and uh, civil liberties. In addition, based on the information uh, collected from the institutions in Kazakhstan, we also compiled an overview to the best of our knowledge uh, of the political and institutional reforms that were introduced since uh, President Tokayev took office in 2019. Mrs. Alvira Azimova, the Human Rights Ombudswoman of Kazakhstan, has just provided us with a very helpful overview of these reforms and how live they are in their development in Kazakhstan itself. Let me now, um, in also mindful of, of the time available and uh, the, uh, the debate and the questions and answers that we might that we might want to address, let me allow to share with you the key findings of our research. Firstly, Kazakhstan has signed and ratified a full range of international human rights treaties, conventions, and protocols. Importantly, the country also demonstrates openness to expand uh, the uh, commitments. An illustration uh, is uh, the signing of the second protocol of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights aiming at the abolition of the death penalty. Secondly, Kazakhstan pursues a progressive evolutionary implementation of these standards. This is reflected in the reviews of Kazakhstan's state of implementation of human rights standards by, among others, the UN periodical universal periodic review and the various the various human rights treaty bodies. The third finding, and this is of key importance to our Brussels audience here today as well, is that Kazakhstan plays an active role and engages internationally in a collaborative spirit when it comes to human rights and fundamental freedoms. This importantly includes the EU-Kazakhstan human rights dialogue which takes place under the Enhanced Partnership and Cooperation Agreement between Kazakhstan and the European Union. I'm sure we will hear more from uh, Mr. Dietmar Chrysler, who is here with us today and who is the head of the, e the Division for Central Asia at the European External Action Service. In addition, EU-Kazakhstan relations also contain an important element of interparliamentary dialogue and cooperation, which also includes exchanges about human rights matters. I am looking forward to hearing the views of MEP Atiza Alieva Beli, who is the deputy chair of the EU Kazakhstan, or in its acronym DECAS delegation, as well as a member of parliament, Tatiana Zdanoka, Zdanoka sorry, who is the substitute member in DECAS. Moving on to the fourth takeaway from our report. It can be argued that the manifold political, institutional, and legal reforms that have been presented in the last two years under the auspices of President Tokayev 
are a testament to the Kazakhstan commitments in terms of human rights reforms. The implementation of these reforms is ongoing and the results should be monitored very carefully. Our fifth main finding is that following the recent uh, universal periodic review and the reports of the various UN treaty bodies, several recommendations have been made to address a range of concerns and improve shortcomings in the human rights implementation in Kazakhstan. We have seen uh, on, at, this, at the same time that a large majority of these recommendations, uh, we believe that we have counted around about 87% of these recommendations is supported by Kazakhstan and is either addressed or in the process of being addressed. This is of course very encouraging. And finally, it follows from our research that the existing concerns are mainly focused on civil society aspects of human rights compliance, including the freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, independence of the judiciary, fair trial and torture or ill treatment of prisoners and other detainees, as well as the prevention of impunity for such violations. It uh, has been referred to um, uh, by previous speakers as well as part of the um, uh, uh, analysis and introductory remarks. Our report concludes by making a number of recommendations to the Republic of Kazakhstan. This includes, the recommendations include remaining to first and foremost remain engaged in international human rights fora with international partners, including of course the European Union with which Kazakhstan has an important uh, relationship and a bilateral uh, cooperation agreement in place. Importantly, ensuring implementation, monitoring and taking stock of the political, institutional and legal reforms and human rights commitments. This is an ongoing um, uh, concern, of course. Other key recommendations include maintaining and strengthening uh, the collaboration uh, with civil society organizations upon the recommendations issued by the Universal Periodic Review, as well as the uh, reports uh, under the UN treaty bodies. And of course, there is a very specific uh, dynamic when it comes to the recommendations around elections, for example, issued by the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, as well as in the uh, framework of the EU uh, European External Action Service Human Rights Dialogue. Furthermore, the Kazakh authorities uh, should actively engage with international partners to provide fact-based information and to counter disinformation. Finally, additional signatures and ratifications of human rights instruments and protocols, as well as the facilitation of an independent review and an in-country audit uh, following up uh, to the suggestions in this uh, report could also be considered. Your Excellency, members of the European Parliament, distinguished guests, I will uh, leave my introduction of this report uh, at, uh, at this. And thank you for the participation and the interest in this uh, topic. And of course, towards the end of the uh, session, we are available for any questions and answers that you or questions uh, that you uh, that you would uh, would like to put. Thank you very much, and I give back to Axel. Thank you very much, Jeroen, for your presentation and also for your report, of course, which was a very interesting, readable, and um, I would say committing report. Now we have the pleasure to give the floor to Mrs. Aspenova Mahabat. She is the head of the Kazakhstan Center for Civil Initiatives. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear Mr. Baimuhan, dear Mr. Gotos, dear participants. Uh, first, I would like to thank for organizing this webinar and for the opportunity to share my ideas, thoughts on such high level event. I represent Civic Alliance of Kazakhstan, particularly uh, Civic Alliance of Nur Sultan. The report on human rights in Kazakhstan has an important role as an input, first of all, for modern history documentation of, the, of Kazakhstan's achievements for, uh, for many years. 
uh, and as well, it's like an analysis, uh, analysis instrument for decision makers and uh, civil society organizations in their routine work. At the same time, I would like to underline some issues, some detailed issues uh, for further mitigation and monitoring along with this report. In terms of ecological right, it needs special uh, and urgent attention to the situation with a small Taldikol lake in Nur Sultan. In terms of economic rights, there are continuing restriction in practice on the right of workers to form organizations of their own choosing, in particular the unduly difficult re-registration and deregistration processes, uh, which undermine the exercise of freedom of association. There are uh, the numerous allegations of violations of the basic civil liberties of trade unionists, including violence, intimidation, and harassment. It's recommended to refrain from showing favoritism towards any given trade unions and put an immediate stop to the interference in the establishment and functioning of trade union organizations. In terms of right on health of specific persons and groups, particularly HIV, TB patients, or their, um, uh, their like, uh, relatives, uh, it's extremely important to allocate financial resources for social contracting on HIV, TB prevention among key population on local level systematically and for three year period. Uh, then the legislation on human rights should be analyzed by a regulatory impact assessment. Uh, concerning infra infrastructure for the achievement of human rights commitments, the national program Digital Kazakhstan, there is a still a great demand and access to the internet in the remote places uh, and the quality of internet, for example, in capital or in other cities, uh, it still needs to be improved. Uh, in spite of the digital, uh, digital Kazakhstan program, the reporting system for NGOs getting resources from state budget is still complicated and managed by hard copies. <clears throat> in terms of civil society participation, today we see a transformation of the internal structure of civil society in Kazakhstan the strengthening of some institutions and the crisis of others, requiring the revision of work strategies. For the implementation of this task, it's especially important to develop and expand the network of civic centers in all regions of Kazakhstan and at all, all levels, republical, regional, city, district, and rural. The civic center can and should become a point growth and a driver on the territory for the dynamic sustainable development of NGOs, strengthening of civic activists, the enhancement of the culture and participation. Civic centers can conduct a civilized dialogue on topical social problems, the protection and implementation of citizen rights, the self-organization of residents, and etc. And uh, another one, public council is a good mechanism of a dialogue with the society, especially in terms of human rights. Uh, public Councils can play a significant role between society and the government. And actually, in this term, it's very important to increase public uh, council members' capacity. And the last but not the least, I would like to un underline the hearing state concept. The key paradigm is an effective communication with the society. Unfortunately, in most cases, the communication is formal. It's recommended to radically reconsider the attitude of civil servants to the society. And there should be the concept formula as hearing state plus speaking society is equal speaking state plus hearing society. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mahabat. It was very interesting to hear you. So now we have the pleasure to give the floor to Mrs. Tatiana Znanoka, member of the European Parliament. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, do you hear me? 
yeah we hear you very well thank you yeah thank you for inviting me to to this uh, event and uh, of course thank you thanks to um, uh, your institute yes uh, for providing the study organizing the study um, i have to be honest i did not have yet the opportunity to uh, examine it in details but we'll do this further at least uh, to the upcoming next meeting of parliamentarians in both kazakhstan and european union uh, recently we had such a meeting in brussels and uh, learned a lot uh, of achievements and uh, uh, also shortcomings for further um, further going on on in the field of human rights and uh, i maybe will start with the last uh, last uh, problem mentioned by previous speaker madam mahabat on this uh, public council yeah, there, there was even one of members of parliament who told that he was recently nominated as a member of such a council, but I could not, could not, to my regret, hear proper, proper information on how this public council is uh, organized and who who is nominated whom uh, what uh, what is the proportion of members representing that or that field of civil society and uh, that uh, that is uh, a little bit unclear and uh, i i guess uh, you yourself as a civil society you have to insist you you have to propose persons uh, to this uh, council not to wait while they as far as I understand some of them are nominated from upstairs just uh, as you told to go from downstairs and, and uh, it will it will help mm -hmm. and if not if rejected if some candidacy is rejected then then you will have планируется да это уже другая там можно конечно поговорить об этом они uh, просто uh, heard from some of my colleagues, members of the European Parliament, mentioning just names of people imprisoned or accused of on crimin doing criminal charges, uh, but having a response that these people are not not at all human rights defenders, just just uh, just those who who made serious uh, criminal criminal offenses uh, for me also as a long-standing member of eu central as a delegation and after visiting in principle all five former soviet republics no central as an independent states big concern is uh, just uh, a religious affiliation also in view of uh, of danger which can come from radical islam and also taking into account recent developments in afghanistan and here of course um, mrs azima has mentioned very uh, very important problem of balance between rights and security i am uh, also a member of the european parliament committee for civil rights citizens rights uh, international affair and civil liberties libe short name of the committee and you see here we have rights and also judicial system and this balance between rights and security is very important we sometimes we have to to speak about uh, legitimate interests of society just to defend their right to to life first of all and uh, 
what was unclear to me still uh, the answer how the state deals with religious this freedom of religion in connection with with danger on the other side of radical religious networks and uh, we spoke about this a lot in, in Europe and we have a good experience in the European Union. For example, just on, uh, on dealing with mosques, on uh, watching who, who is executing the, the leadership and these people must not be foreigners. For example, in Belgium, the experience is like this, just not to allow uh, this press uh, to be to be to be foreigners but just local people uh, receiving education in, in the very same state where they want to to lead the religious community and to deal with religious community as far as i saw when visiting on my experience when visiting central asian countries there are a lot of mosques uh, where just comers from Saudi Arabia or Qatar are also executing further work in, in these mosques built, built by. And uh, I think it would be a problem of legitimate, legitimate interest of society to prohibit radical, uh, radical organizations to be approved as a church. As far as I know, in Kazakhstan, maybe that's my question uh, further to Mrs. Azima as an ombudsman, maybe Mrs. Habat. Uh, what is about the law on religious organizations and which religions are a subject for uh, which churches are subject for registration and what about restrictions to be registered as a church in Kazakhstan? I guess this is very important. Just to say that, and I like very much the statement of Mr. Janssen as, is, as well as Mr. Gotthard that, we, Europe, we are not <clears throat> in a position of teacher and we must not be in a position of teacher saying that, yeah, we are perfect ourselves and we have the right to teach others. No, we are not perfect. Mr. Janssen has uh, mentioned his member state, Netherlands, yes. And uh, I can speak about my member state. Just yesterday there was a sentence of, of criminal charge for one journalist, Latvian journalist, just on very false accusations. And we all know that in fact, he was charged, Yuri Alexeyev is his name. He was charged just for writing very critical, critical articles and creating a special portal for discussions, IMHO club on, on certain, very sensitive issues. And uh, there are another political, political offenses, political prisoners. Also my former colleagues in the European Parliament from Catalonia, Raul Junqueras, Raul Romeva, just, just recently released from prison. And I think the pressure was done by Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe. Uh, acknowledging a resolution on a problem of imprisonment of members of parliament in Turkey and in Spain. So we as, as civil rights defendants, and I, I am also one of the founder of one of the oldest human rights NGOs in Latvia, we, we have to use all possibilities to fight against violations of human rights, despite where and when it took place. And also simultaneously try to defend uh, just such human right as right to life. 
yes, which is also under danger, especially in our times. Thank you for the moment, it's, that's all. Thank you very much, Mrs. Zadnoka. Now I have the floor, the honor to give the floor to Mr. Dietmar Kristner. He is the head of division of the European Commission for Central Asia, of, in fact, for the European External Action Service. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Axel, um, and sincere thanks to the European Institute for Asian Studies. I hope you can hear me well. I can hear you very well. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador Baimukan, uh, distinguished Madame Asimova, honorable members of the European Parliament, dear fellow panelists and dear participants. Um, I think this is a timely meeting on Kazakhstan's international human rights commitments and the internal reforms which are underway under the leadership of President Tokayev. Let me say, firstly, that we look forward to welcoming President Tokayev um, for his first official trip to Brussels uh, next month in November. And um, I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate on the election of Kazakhstan as a member of the United uh, Nations Human Rights Council for the period uh, 22 to 24, as other speakers have mentioned it. And um, also uh, for focusing on important priorities in this, uh, in this role, uh, namely upholding human rights in the fight against COVID, um, also human rights in the context of climate change, uh, gender equality, uh, digital inequality, uh, just to name a few of those human rights issues. The European Union wishes Kazakhstan a successful membership in the Human Rights Council. And I think it is um, also uh, appropriate to say that the members of the Human Rights Council have a responsibility to uphold the highest standards in the promotion and the protection of human rights, uh, as uh, some of the previous speakers have mentioned it as well. This is, I think, a timely achievement for Kazakhstan as um, the country also celebrates its uh, 30th anniversary of independence. And also the 30th anniversary of the closure of the Semipalatinsk nuclear test site and I took the liberty to mention this because the European Union acknowledges Kazakhstan's contribution to achieving a nuclear free world and the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. The treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons remains a key multilateral instrument reinforcing international peace, security and stability. And Kazakhstan's contribution to this is very much uh, acknowledged and appreciated. And we also comment Kazakhstan on the abolition of the death penalty, it was mentioned before, following the ratification of the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU is supportive of President Tokayev's ambitious reform and modernization processes, including uh, a political transformation and improving the business and investment climate. The rule of law, good governance and fighting corruption, all those are essential issues for a functioning democracy and attracting foreign investment. Um, let me emphasize that EU-Kazakhstan bilateral relations have been strengthened with the entry into force of the Enhanced Partnership and Cooperation Agreement in March last year. This agreement provides a strong framework to support Kazakhstan in its reform and modernization processes. And I also wanted to underline the strength and cooperation between the European Union and Kazakhstan on human rights. Since last May, we had had many high level visits. Um, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Tiloy Berdi traveled to Brussels uh, to chair the EU-Kazakhstan Cooperation Council in May this year, 
um, the special representative of the president for, for international cooperation, Mr. Kazikan, visited Brussels in June. Uh, the, um, Ms. Asimova actually uh, visited uh, Brussels in July, and it's good to see you here again, uh, Ms. Asimova. And of course, the Minister uh, for Justice, um, Mr. Beketayev, visited uh, Brussels in September, and this was already mentioned by Ms. Asimova uh, before. So for all those visits, I think it, uh, it is fair to say that there was a particular focus on human rights and, and those you know, sensitive issues were sometimes uh, were discussed in an open and frank manner. And um, we are also encouraged by the increased cooperation on human rights with the Office on the, of the Ombudsperson and also with the Ministry of Justice. Um, Nonetheless, let me stress that there is general agreement that more needs to be done on the effective implementation of reforms on human rights. And I think Mr. Janssen has also uh, um, said that in his, um, in his presentation. We believe that efforts must be strengthened uh, to ensure the promotion and the protection of human rights in Kazakhstan. The, the dialogue on that uh, on the ground um, in uh, Nur Sultan is, uh, is, is, is very good. I must say there are monthly meetings between the delegation of the European Union in uh, Nur Sultan and the Ministry of Justice. Um, they started this, uh, this summer and, um, and we are really able to raise human rights issues and other issues which are um, related to us by, by NGOs and we are, we are able to to raise those issues with, uh, with the authorities. Um, myself, earlier this month, I had the opportunity to travel to Nur Sultan and also to Almaty, um, together with the EU Special Representative for Human Rights, uh, Mr. Eamon Gilmore, and also together with the EU Special Representative for Central Asia, uh, Ms. Terhi Hakala. And um, that was on the occasion of the EU Central Asia Civil Society Forum. And I would like to thank Kazakhstan also for hosting this important event. And um, I was very pleased by my, this was my first mission actually uh, to Kazakhstan. I was able to meet with representatives of civil society. Uh, we were able to listen to their concerns, um, but we had also open discussions with many high level officials and, uh, the, and the Kazakh authorities. The, uh, the EU Central Asia Civil Society Forum, I think, was an important opportunity to give um, civil society representatives in the region a platform to discuss openly current challenges and to foster the exchange between them. So I'm also looking forward now to returning to Nur Sultan uh, at the beginning of September for the next human rights dialogue between the European Union and uh, Kazakhstan. And we will be also holding a, a, a meeting, a, a committee meeting on justice and home affairs between the EU and Kazakhstan on that occasion. Um, as we do uh, usually, and as we prepare those, those dialogues, um, we meet with um, civil society um, representatives, um, uh, both in Brussels, but also in uh, Nur Sultan. Uh, those meetings will be organized in the course of next month. And um, we, we, we listen to their concerns, we, we take note and uh, we, we, we try to, to, to bring their concerns into the discussions that we'll be having later on then with the Kazakh authorities. Um, so the, the, the European Union delegation in Nur Sultan is very active in in meeting those uh, civil society representatives and, and human rights defenders as well. Um, and as I said, their feedback really is an important source of information for us and, and for our colleagues working on the ground. And um, it, uh, it helps us really to prepare well um, and, and also with a, with a substance really for those uh, annual human rights dialogues. Uh, as I said, the next one will be holding then at the beginning of December in Nur Sultan. Um, I would like to leave it here, uh, Axel, many thanks for the floor and uh, ready, of course, for further uh, interaction with the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dietmar, for your very interesting presentation. 
uh, I first would like to mention to everybody, to the audience and the panelists, that as we started a little bit later, we will in fact go on up to, I would say, quarter past uh, 12. So uh, we will add 50 minutes to our uh, webinar. So to uh, have the possibility that everybody can still also in questions and answers now session, uh, have a possibility to, for, to reply. So I would like to have first myself uh, put a question, in fact, to our uh, panelists from Kazakhstan. And in fact, it's as Kazakhstan will be again a member to the next upcoming rotation round of the United Nations Human Rights Council for 2022 and up to 24. What would be the priorities you would, uh, as a member of Kazakhstan, engage to? Uh, what would be really also topics which you would find very important to put on the agenda? So that's my, uh, I would say, it's quite important for us to hear from our Kazakhstan panelists about that. Please, the floor is yours. Can I put it perhaps the question to the to Mrs. Uh, Azimova as a human rights ombudswoman uh, in the first place? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I can see that there are also questions in the chat and they are very specific questions, but first of all, I would like to ask the question that was asked by Axel. So what are our expectations and what are our aspirations when Kazakhstan will be a member of the UN Council on Human Rights? First of all, these are in line with the obligations that Kazakhstan has taken. The report that was undertaken by EIS, you've mentioned that out of 245 recommendations that were given to Kazakhstan from the UPR, 214 recommendations were accepted by Kazakhstan, including those on human rights defenders, defendants and prevention of torture and inhumane treatment. And that is why right now I'm referring to specific issues because in the chat, there was a question regarding those issues. So what are our expectations? First of all, we believe that we'll be working along the lines of our commitments in line with the Universal Periodic Review, namely the 214 recommendations that Kazakhstan has accepted, including gender equality, equal opportunities for men and women, prevention of torture and inhumane treatment. Also, it applies to the improvement of our penal code and legislation so that there is no discrimination vis-a-vis -vis specific groups of people. So when it comes to prosecution of, say, criticism against the state. And secondly, of course, will be decriminalizing certain articles of our penal code. So we'll be also honing our legislation regarding our trade unions. And finally, we have received an answer from the government on how we can review certain articles in our legislation when it applies to trade union organizations. We're involved in an active dialogue, and I believe that we'll be able to come to a mutually acceptable solution so that human rights are adhered to and our obligations are also there. The second issue was regarding the registration of civil society NGOs. We have received certain complaints regarding the cases when the applications were rejected, but I can tell you that our 
Ministry of Public Awareness has tabled a proposal to review the actual law on associations and public associations. We have established a working group and the government has supported our proposal. And the government is also planning up until 2023 to introduce a number of specific amendments. And here I believe that it would be really important for the representatives of the civil society to be actively engaged in this process, because at this very juncture, it's high time when we could say that, all right, it's one thing when you can criticize and argue that this is wrong, that's what the government has done not well. But I believe that right now, it's really important to consolidate all the efforts within the civil society and also to increase the level on the part of oversight so that there are open hearings. But again, don't come to a draft legislation review when it's already submitted by the government, when everything, including all the work has been done, be it say changes to certain articles of the penal code. No, you should be involved from the very beginning. You should be involved in the contact with the prosecutor general. So don't use just external platforms like there are questions in the chat. But look, you need to work within the country. There have to be meetings on a daily basis so that external experts and you, European parliamentaries are referring to recommendations, proposals, best practices, but we are here within the country and as citizens, we must be part of the process. And when we say that we need to organize visits to political prisoners, well, excuse me, but I have to say here that there are certain decisions by the court. And when you speak about visits to those prisoners or inmates, well, I'm the ombudsman. I have to visit the penitentiary facilities and to see whether the Mandela rules are adhered to. This is our priority. Vulnerable people, people with disabilities, women with young children, rights of people who are affected by a serious disease. And as a result, they are taken as untreatable diseases. Well, we understand all this, but we understand that they are the priority. But if it's about a certain sentence from the court that has already entered in the fourth and we don't agree with that. Well, there are specific procedures that can be applied given the prosecutor general status and also the court because the constitution stipulates that it's up to the prosecutor general's office to supervise this. So nobody can interfere in the court's decision. So we have the laws and also non-conflict instruments. And in this context, we are ready to work, but I cannot speak what I am intending to do because it's a very long-term dialogue. And we understand that there is a list of specific prisoners, but there are also penal codes. There are certain obligations that Kazakhstan has undertaken on gradual amendments to this legislation. And this includes to prosecution for terrorism and extremism. And Kazakhstan is reviewing this articles because experts are concerned of, with the situation in this area. Therefore, by that, we need to exclude the possibility of uh, other possible claims and complaints and also prosecution of uh, people following these articles just for criticizing the government. Therefore, I believe that in this respect, uh, the possibility to work in a constructive manner is the obligation of everyone, of all the stakeholders of the dialogue. You need to get involved not only at the very last stage and not to be uh, just an observer, you need to be an involved participant. And this is the trend we've seen during the pandemic. You know, before the pandemic, we had been talking about human rights, but now we don't have enough time. Even in Kazakhstan, you see that the process of political reforms has a great uh, tempo and of legislative amendments as well. 
therefore, for the civil society, it is of utmost importance to be competitive and to be involved in these processes straight from the outset. And the uh, civil society activists should not have uh, problems with law themselves because they are informal ambassadors of the people talking about the question about religious organizations, uh, which Ms. Shankov asked me. Um, you know, this question was also raised, I raised that question, and uh, the government of the Republic of Kazakhstan on June the 11th of this year adopted uh, the uh, action plan for human rights uh, issues and um, the re religious uh, traditions uh, and the religious literature and the definition of, of those things has to be uh, fine-tuned in order to prevent uh, the criminal prosecution on that basis. Parliament of the Republic is discussing those issues. The dialogue is ongoing. I welcome the fact that the Ministry of Information and Public Development, which is responsible uh, for uh, interaction with religious organizations and for uh, human uh, rights uh, uh, for, for religion, have opened a new site for dialogue. And this uh, dialogue will be ongoing with external experts. As far as I know, the American side also requested such a dialogue on the platform I've just mentioned. So I do hope that if uh, the European side is also interested in that, you can get involved. And the latest developments, which make me very glad, uh, that uh, Kazakhstani parliament, par uh, parliament members meet with European Parliament members and authorities uh, meet as well, thus creating a better platform. So we have uh, the uh, extended dialogue, uh, Republic of Kazakhstan and EU, and now on a monthly basis, both sides meet and discuss the most urgent issues. And such a constructive dialogue is extremely important. In this context, we must continue this dialogue also with the civil society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your reply. Um, I would like also to ask to the other panelists uh, if they want to comment on uh, issues uh, because we saw a number in the question and answer box, a number of questions, but they are very long questions. So uh, if I start to read them, all the questions, we will still need too much time. So, but everybody of the panelists could read them already in the question and answer box. Are there any of the other panelists who would like to reply to those questions? And also because our MEP, uh, Mrs. Danoka, she also had a question about uh, the religious issues. The um, floor is open for the other panelists, please. Is there any other panelist? Uh, Ms. Yes, Mr. Chrysler. Ditma, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Axel. I, I just, uh, in the chat, I read, I read uh, the question of, of Ms. Bibi, Bibigul Imangalieva. Uh, she was, uh, she says they, she has suffered herself and, and also many others uh, have suffered forms of political repression. Um, look, I mean, I, I'm not going to make comments on um, uh, how Ms. Asimova reacted to that or did not this is not uh, this is not up to me to do that but i i want to say that um and i was trying also in my presentation to make this a bit clear that we monitor and we listen very carefully um and with a lot of attention to everyone who has these kind of uh, issues and has has had those kind of experiences um we take note of that and as i said we have different levels of dialogue uh, with the Kazakh authority, authorities. Uh, this includes also a dialogue at a very high political level, um, but it includes most of all dialogue at a sort of um, working level, uh, at, at my own level, um, in, in, in the form of a very institutionalized um, um, uh, you know, structure 
the human rights dialogue and and these issues are taken up in those dialogues this is the appropriate form for us as a european external action service to um to bring up those issues and to ask um for explanations and to ask for um uh, answers we also bring up very uh individual cases if necessary um i i cannot go into details of course in such a, a for, forum here but um, I, I, I want to reassure you that as a diplomatic service, these issues are, are, are not, not neglected for the sake of good diplomatic relations with a third country. This is not the case. There are critical dialogues, critical uh, uh, sessions, and those kind of issues are, um, are uh, mentioned and, and, and responses and reactions are being expected. Should they not expect, should they not come, should they not come forward, should they not be sufficient? Um, there are other measures that the European Union can take, uh, as you know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dietmar. Are there other of the panelists who wants to take the floor? Mrs. Mahabat, please. Do you want to have also some comments? Yeah, uh, Elvira Zimova. Um, this is this is still Elvira Azimova, if you allow me. Yes. You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to answer in the chat. Well, if possible, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not going to answer on the on, in the chat. I would just like to say that a lot of question concern the so-called political, uh, polit politically motivated prosecutions and uh, related criticism, I see that questions are numerous. However, they all deal with the same problems. First, I would like to point out that human rights for Kazakhstan are not limited to just one issue, to the uh, prosecution of activists. However, a political rights issue is extremely important because this is a barometer, a sign of the level of democracy in a state. And of course, we do not forget about this issue. However, this is um, the responsibility of state authorities when, they, when people uh, get involved in the judiciary system and the criminal law should be very fair in that issue and the uh, dominance of law is of paramount importance. Or when we see the questions about visiting political prisoners or not visiting, I have already answered that. As far as other questions are concerned, for example, well, you know, personal questions to me and they addressed me personally and they're kind of making a statement here. Well, what I would like to say here is as follows. Yes, there have been uh, questions addressed to me concerning rights of some particular people from these lists about the conditions of their incarceration. I'm not going to talk about it here in a public platform because it has to do with uh, private uh, data, with personal data. I'm not going to discuss them here. However, I think that what we need to discuss and are the questions regarding the efficiency and the effectiveness on the law on uh, peaceful meetings and the right of citizens to express their opinion and to be part of those meetings. We shouldn't forget that any criticism should be structured in the correct way and it should be followed up. It is important not just to criticize someone, but it's also important to stand up for those rights. And there is a third point, and please, I would like to reiterate, I would like to come back to those who ask those questions. Please don't abuse and blackmail those people um, who you, uh, who, whose your questions are concerned. Don't forget about underage children because you do use them as a part of blackmail and uh, or during your appeals. 
I believe that those who, who are supposed to hear me have heard me. And this is not right when you uh, appeal to, to, to people, to asking them uh, to talk to their underage children. This is not right. I am open for dialogue. I am open for criticism. I am open to talking about uh, socially vulnerable people and incarcerated people, but we shouldn't ignore other rights, social, economic, civil liberties. So in this context, we must uh, conduct the dialogue. You know, when people ask me, what have you done? My uh, counter suggestion is let's do things together. Please come to me and we'll not only talk, but we will develop the most, uh, uh, the, the, the best solutions. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Azimova, for your comments again. Um, are there other panelists who still want to have comments? Um, otherwise, we are coming to closing time of the webinar, but I also would like to say, I think it's very interesting to have this open discussions. Uh, of course, we must also take in consideration that Kazakhstan is now 30 years of independent country and it's not an easy situation for those countries in Central Asia. When you come from a Soviet style society and political structure to be first of all, becoming independent, stay independent, have a stability in the society, going back to your own cultural identity, it's not a very easy exercise. And there is always this balance between stability and progression in civil society standards, human rights standards, and so on. So we see there is a positive approach, a very positive approach from the Kazakhstan government to all those issues, but we must understand uh, that it's not a very easy way always to progress. I would therefore thank all the participants, the panelists for the contribution and the audience for listening. And I think this kind of discussions, I think we should still continue and uh, see, and we wish really that to see, and also we hope and, but that really Kazakhstan can go forward on this way of opening society, becoming a more and more democratic country, but we have seen it already. Right? There are the elections. They are going forward in, I would say, in a very, I would say, constructive way, but also in elections, people have to learn as well, I would say, voters, as well as the politicians, how the democratic voting process happens. So I would say all the success to Kazakhstan and thank you all for the attention from the panelists and the audience. Thank you very much.